So good morning everyone. Today in this chapter I today we are going to discuss chapter 7 and chapter 8. So together with me is Mr. Abbas Justin Dominic, Miss Jean Kasimsiman, and yours truly Miss Gabilan April Joy, Mr. Magdale Axel Augustus, Mr. Salvation Arwin Jr., Miss Luna May Frazel and Mr. Miko Balverde. So in this chapter 7, this title, Collecting and Analyzing Diagnostic Information. <coughs> Excuse me. So our learning objectives is to understand the importance of diagnostic relationship in the OD process. Second, to describe the methods for diagnosing and collecting data. And last, to understand and utilize techniques for analyzing data. The process begins by establishing an effective relationship between the OD practitioner and those from whom data will be collected and then choosing data collection techniques. The process of collecting information that will be shared with the client in jointly assessing how the organization is functioning and determining the best change intervention. So one of the examples is in this is that they might interview members of a work team about causes of conflict among members. So one of the best scenario is that in the case of Anne Marie's team and Eduardo's team, if you are still familiar with it, the two teams have a problem and they are currently at odds. So in order for this kind of organizational issue to be solved, the consultant really needs to collect and gather data on both parties or they might conduct a survey about factors contributing to poor quality, to poor product quality rather. So next, the diagnostic relationship. In most cases of plan change, OD practitioners play an active role in gathering data from the organization members for diagnostic purposes. So before collecting diagnostic information, practitioners need to establish a relationship with those who will provide and subsequently use it. A diagnostic relationship is very essential to the organization because it helps organization members start thinking about issues concern concern them and it creates expectation that change is possible so when members trust the consultant they are likely to participate in the diagnostic process and to generate the energy and com commitment of the organizational change so next in establishing the diagnostic relationship between consultant and relevant organization members is similar to forming a contract it is meant to clarify expectations and to specify the conditions of the relationship. And the, the answers of the following questions below provided the substance of the diagnostic contract. First, who am I? The answer to this question introduces the OD practitioner to the organization, particularly to those members who do not know the consultant and yet will be asked to provide diagnostic data. Second, why am I here? And what am I doing? The consultant needs to present the objectives of the action research process and to describe how the diagnostic activities fit into the overall developmental strategies. Third, who do I work for? This answers clarifies who has hired the consultant, whether it be it a manager, a group of managers, or a group of employees and managers. And one way to build trust and support for the diagnosis is that to have those people directly involved in establishing diagnostic contract. Thus, for example, if the consultant of if the consultant works for a joint labor management committee, representatives from both sides of that group could help the consultant build the proper relationship with those from whom data will be gathered. Next is what do I want from you and why? Here, the consultant needs to specify how much time and effort people will need to give to provide valid data and subsequently to work with this data in solving problems. Because some people may not want to participate in the diagnosis. So it is time consuming if, if, if they do that kind of attitude. 
So it is important to specify that such involvement is voluntary. Next is, how will I protect your confidentiality? This answer addresses member concerns about who will see their responses and in what form. This is especially critical when employees are asked to provide information about their attitudes or perceptions. OD practitioners can either ensure confidentiality or state that full, particip full participation in the change process requires open information sharing. In the first case, employees are frequently concerned about privacy and possibility of being punished for your responses. And next is, who will have access to data? So in this, respondents typically want to know whether they will have access to their data and who else in the organization will have similar access. And next, what's in it for me? So this answer is aimed at providing organizations mem members with a clear delineation of the benefits they can expect from the diagnosis. This usually entails describing the feedback process and how they can use the data to improve the organization. And last, can the practitioner be trusted? The diagnostic relationship ultimately rests on the trust established between the consultant and those providing the data. So an open and honest exchange of information depends on such trust and the practitioner should provide sample time and face-to-face -face contact during the contracting process to build this trust. So furthermore, the diagnostic stage of action research is probably the first time that the most organization members meet the OD practitioners and it can be the basis for building longer-term relationship. Next. The next topic is the methods for collecting data. So there are four major techniques in gathering the data and those methods are questionnaires, interviews, observation, and unobtrusive measures. Those method has this advantage and disadvantage. First, questionnaires. Questionnaire is typically contain fixed response about different features of an organization. And the advantage is that easy analysis and summarize, which the questionnaire allow easy analysis of results with the use of computer or other tools. Next is large quantities of data, which can gather information from a larger number of people and can also use online to distribute the question to anyone or anywhere. The disadvantage of questionnaire is the response biases, which the respondents may not be willing to provide honest answer, which the dishonesty can be an issue. Next is the overinterpretation of data. So when the questionnaire is not present to the respondents in face-to-face, -face, they may have this different interpretation of the questions. The second is the interview. Interview is permit the interviewer to ask the respondents direct questions. So the interview can also be done in face-to-face -face or video conferencing tools. So the advantage is that builds rapport with subject. So to establish good relationship to the participant to make them feel comfortable, especially towards the sensitive topic. Next is the source of rich data. So the interview can interviewer can ask the follow-up question for the additional information and the disadvantage of interview is time consuming which the preparation of interview taking the interview and the interpretation of the responses and the set the disadvantage also is the bias in interview which the answer of the respondents can be affected by the reaction to the interviewer's race class age and physical appearance next the third is observation which collects data by observing organizational behavior in their functional setting, which the OD practitioner may do walking or through the working area and looking around. And the, the observation tool that may use is film, videotape, and other methods to record. So the advantage is collect data on actual behavior, which the observer does not have to ask other people about their behavior, which they can simply watch the individual act and speak and real-time, which real-time behavior can happen in the present rather than the past. And the disadvantage of observation is that observer bias, which the personal view of the observer may have his own ideas of right and wrong, and expensive because the observation involves traveling, staying at the place of observing, which it's not only the people to observe. And the fourth is the unobtrusive measure. So let's define first the unobtrusive. So unobtrusive. Unobstrusive is 
not attracting attention or not easily noticed. So this measure is collected from secondary source such as company records and archives. So the advantage is that non-reactive because the people being studied are not aware of it. No response bias because the respondents are not asked to stop what they are doing because the organization will give the information. And the disadvantage is that validity concern, which the company the company records may not include all the data that is usable by the consultant. And the other is the difficulties in changes, which the changes in methods of recording data rather than what is the actual changes in the organization. So next, the next topic is the sampling. Sampling is the process of selecting sample from the population, which they do not need to research the entire population to collect the data. The population versus sample. So, population is the entire population you want to draw conclusion, while sample is the specific individuals that you will collect the data. So, there are two types of sampling methods, probability and non-probability. In probability sampling methods is every individual in the population has a chance of being selected. And those uh, probability sampling methods are simple, random, and stratified sample. In simple, random is that you want to select 100 employees of the company A. So this is an example. So you will assign a number to every employee in the company from 1 to 1,000. Then use a random number generator to select 100 employees, which means every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. And the stratified sampling is about dividing the population into subpopulation. For example, gender, age, income, job role, and more. So that is the probability. While the non-probability sampling is the selection is based on non-random criteria and not individual has a chance of being selected. So there are two types of non-probability, the convenient sample and the snowball sampling. So in convenient sampling is you only survey who are convenient at that moment. While the snowball sampling is the participant of the study will recruit others. So this method is usually used where the topic is sensitive, like information about HIV AIDS. So the next topic is techniques for analyzing data. Data analysis techniques fall into two broad classes. First is qualitative. Qualitative tools, these are methods that do not involve measurement or statistics, such as interviewing, observation, discussions, and review of documents. In qualitative term, Two of the most important are content analysis and force field analysis. Content analysis is a research technique used to make replicable and valid inferences by interpreting and coding textual material. Force field analysis. It provides a framework for looking at the factors that influence a situation, either driving movement toward a goal or blocking movement toward a goal. Force field analysis has two major categories. Force Forces for change and forces for maintaining the status quo. Just like the figure show, these forces, are, these forces for change are offset by two strong forces for maintaining the status quo. Group norms supporting present levels of performance and well-learned skills that are resistant to change. Next slide. Collecting and analyzing diagnostic data at Allergent Health. Interview measures. They were asked questions about the clarify of action plans the level of involvement of different people and implementation progress. Survey measures. A survey is an instrument used to collect information from people about their characteristics, behaviors, attitudes, or perceptions. Surveys typically use numeric or descriptive rating scales. Next slide. Quantitative tools. Quantitative data collection tools collect data that can be counted and subjected to statistical analysis. Quantitative data are numerical, ordinal, or nominal. For example, surveys, questionnaires, and evaluations that include multiple choice items and ratings. Mean standard deviations and frequency distributions. One of the most economical and straightforward ways to summarize quantitative data. This represents, this, this represents the respondents and average score and the spread of variability of the respondents. Scattergram and correlation coefficients. A scatter plot displays the strength, direction, and form of the relationship between two quantitative 
variables. A correlation coefficient measures the strength of the relationship. The correlation measures the strength of the linear relationship between two quantitative variables. Next slide, chapter 8. So for an overview about chapter 8 topic, feeding back diagnostic information can help to get a result or improvement in the OD process. And with that, the following are learning objectives in this chapter and the next slide. First is to understand the importance of data feedback in the OD process. Second is to describe the desired characteristics of feedback content. Third is to learn the desired characteristics of feedback process and last to define what is survey feedback and its step. Now let's talk about the first learning objective which is the importance of feeding back diagnostic information on the next slide. With the help of this, it will determine if the organization can use the information to create a relative plan. The purpose of this process is to ensure that the client has the ownership of the data, but in what way? So to sum it up, let us look at the next slide for the structure. The consultant will first have the feedback and will be the one to organize it. It will then clear presented to the client. And <clears throat> depending on the client's side of understanding the feedback, it will then lead to analyzation or resistance. In the case of analyzing the data, a change or improvement using this information will then use to develop an effective action plan. And of course, with the case of resistance, when the client will not accept the data, it may cause unchanged or uh, unchanged with the information and worse, may lead to failure. And again, the main objective of this process is for the client to be sure that they have the ownership of the data. Why? Because with this feedback data, a client can able to determine the potential of the change process. In an example scenario of this, if a large amount of data had been collected in the limited period of time, it may be unrealistic to achieve the change. The client will then see the possibility of improving or adjusting adjusting the action plan. And for the next topic, let's tackle about determining <clears throat> that diagnostic information. Determining the content of the feedback. In the course of diagnosing the, the organization, a large amount of data is collected. In fact, there is often more information that the client needs or can interpret in a re realistic period of time. If too ma many data are fed back, the client may decide that changing is impossible. Therefore, OD practitioner practitioners need to summarize the data in ways that enable clients to understand the information and draw action implications from it. The techniques for data analysis described in Chapter 7 can inform this task. Additional criteria for determining the content of diagnostic feedback are described below. Several characteristics of effective feedback data have been described in the literature. They include the following nine properties. Relevant. Organization members are likely to use feedback data for problem solving when they find the information meaningful including managers and employee, employees in the initial data collection activities can increase the relevance of the data. Understandable. Data must be presented to organizations members in a form that is readily interpreted. Statistical data, for example, can be made understandable through the use of graph and charts. Descriptive. Feedback data need to be linked to, to real organizational behaviors if they are to arouse and direct energy. The use of examples and detailed illustrations can help employees gain a better feel for the data. Next slide. Verifiable. Feedback data should be valid and accurate if they are to guide action 
Thus, the inf information should allow organization members to verify whether the, <clears throat> for example, questionnaire data might include information about the sample of respondents as well as frequency distribu distributions for each item or measure. Such information can help members verify whether the feedback data accurately represent organizational events or attitude. Timely. Data should be fed back to members as quickly as possible after being collected and analyzed. This will help ensure the, that the information is still valid and is linked to members' motivations to examine it. Limited. Limited because people can easily become overloaded with too much information. Feedback data should be limited to what employees can realistically process at one time. Significant. Feedback should be limited to those feed those problems that organizations member can do something about because it will energize them and help direct their effort toward realistic changes. Comparative. Feedback data can be ambiguous without some benchmark as a reference. Whenever possible, data from comparative groups should be provided to give organization members a better idea of, of how their group fits into a broader context. And finalize. Feedback is primarily a stimulus for action and thus should spur further diagnosis and problem solving. Members should be encouraged, for example, to use the data as a starting point for more in-depth discussion of organizational issues. Next slide. Characteristics of feedback process. Ownership of the feedback data is facilitated by the following five features of the successful feedback processes. So motivation to work with data. This may require explicit sanctions and supports from powerful groups so that people feel free to raise issues and to identify concerns during the feedback sessions. If people have little motivation to work with data or feel that there is little chance to use the data for change, then the information will not be owned by the client system. So if the members must be mindful on the purpose of the activity, be only encouraged to participate, participate since it was for organizational development. They must be motivated to not resist change because in order, it is for them to um, it is for them to improve their selves themselves better to have better behavior. So next slide, please. Structure for the meeting. Feedback meetings need some structure or they may de degenerate into chaos or aimless discussion. An agenda or outline for the meeting and the presence of discussions leader can usually provide the necessary directions. If the meeting is not kept on track, especially when the data are negative, ownership can be lost in conversation that become too general. When this happens, the energy gained from dealing directly with the problem is lost. So it is important to organize the meeting because it gives some um, properly direction to deal with the problems. Next slide, please. Appropriate attendance. Those people have problems are included in feedback meeting. They are required to join since they have also issues and concerns. All depart departments or any hierarchical level shall attend to participate or work with data. Without proper representation in the meeting, the data of ownerships might be lost because suggested feedback unable to address the problem. Appropriate power. The positions of power by the group is important to be clarified. Member must be aware of which issues is necessarily to change, on what recommended for change, and where members has no control. Process help. It is important to require assistance on feedback meeting. Other practitioner with group process skills to help to help member focused on the subjects. It also improved feedback discussion and ownership to not resist on change. 
Survey feedback. What is a survey feedback? Survey feedback is a process of collecting and feeding back data from an organization or department through the use of a questionnaire or a survey. Because questionnaires often are used in organization diagnosis, particularly in all the efforts involving large numbers of participants, and because it is a powerful intervention in its own right. Survey feedback is discussed here as a special case of data, data feedback. There are steps in survey feedback. First is the member of the organization, including those at the top, are involved primarily planning of survey. In this step, all parties must be clear about the level of analysis, such as organization, department, or small group, and the ob objectives of the survey. Second is the survey instrument is administered to all members of the organization or department. This breadth of data collection is ideal because it may be appropriate to administer the instrument to only a sample of members because of cost of time and constraints. The third is the audit cons consultant usually analyzes the survey data, tabulates the results, suggests approaches to diagnosis, and trains client members to lead feedback process. Fourth is data feedback usually begins at the top of the organization and cascades downward to groups reporting to managers successively lower levels. This step is like a waterfall, waterfall approach that ensures that all groups at all organizational levels involved in the survey receive appropriate feedback, and this data feedback also can occur in bottom-up approach. Fifth is feedback meetings provide an opportunity to work with data. When there is greater dependency, dependency among units and they need to coordinate, coordinate their efforts, survey feedback must take into account relationships among the units paying particularly attention to the possibility of intergroup conflict. Survey feedback and organizational deficiency. Traditionally, the steps of survey feedback have been applied to work groups and organizational units with attention to dependencies among them. However, that the data design of the survey's feedback should vary depending on how closely the participating units are linked with one another. When the units are relatively independent and have a little need to interact, survey feedback can focus on the dynamics occurring within each group and can be applied to the group separately. Limitations of survey feedback. First is the ambiguity of purpose. Managers and staff, group, staff groups responsible for the survey feedback process may have difficulty reaching sufficient consensus about the purpose of the survey, its content, and how it will be feedback to participants. On this, such confusion can lead to considerable disagreement over data collected and paralysis about doing anything with them. Second is distrust. High level of distrust in the organization can render the survey feedback ineffectively. In this, if employees need to trust that their responses will remain anonymous and that the management is serious about sharing the data and solving problem jointly. Third is unacceptable topics. Most organizations have certain topics that they do not want to examine. In this, this can severely constrain the scope of the survey process, particularly if the neglected topics are important. The fourth is the organizational disturbance. The survey feedback process can undoubt, undoubtedly disturb organizational functioning. Data collection and feedback typically infringe on employee work time. So the administration should survey and call the attention to, is, to the issue which, which management is unwilling to deal. And they should create unrealistic expectation about organizational improvement. 
Before we ended our presentation, we want to leave a message. One day you'll be at the place where you wanted to be. That's all. Thank you.